Welcome to the VO School podcast, dedicated to the art, craft, and business of voiceover. Each week builds upon the last to give you a comprehensive understanding of a career in VO. My name's Jamie Muffet. I'm a full-time voice talent and audio engineer, and I'll be joined by some of the industry's top professionals on both sides of the microphone to drill down and dig up the truth. Hello, welcome to episode 13 of the VO School podcast. And today is an extra special episode. It's the first in a series of three over the festive season. And this one is going to be a highlights package of the first four episodes of this run. So I've scoured those first four episodes for, I think, the highlights and facts and tidbits that you should employ in your career and use moving forward. Think of this as a sort of Cliff Notes quick guide to starting out in the voiceover industry. As I say, there'll be two more covering episodes 5 to 8 and then 9 to 12 in the new year. As per usual, you can connect with us on Facebook. That is facebook.com slash groups slash VO School podcast. That's becoming a really, really great place to chat, ask questions, um, get some feedback and uh, various other social activities. We're also on Twitter at VO School Pro. We have an email, voschoolpodcast at gmail.com. And for all the links to all of our social, our email, and all the places where you can listen to the podcast, you can go to our new website, and that is voschoolpodcast.com. That's a real central hub to find all of these links. Okay, right, we're going to have a quick ad break, and you're going to be hearing a fair amount of me this week, unfortunately because I'll be introducing the clips to give them a bit of context and then you'll hear me at the end as well. Lucky you. Okay, here it is. Style. Power. You're watching the home of the NFL. The all-new iPhone. Reserve your Disney World season pass now. Through all the runny noses, three in the morning coughs, an all-new American crime story tonight on FX. Hi, it's J. Michael Collins, and these are just a few examples of the first-class demos my team and I are producing. If you'd like to have something similar, visit jmcvoiceover.com and click on the Demo Production tab to find out more. In the first episode of the VO School podcast, I talked with Amanda Rose Smith and Rudy Gaskins about the state of the voiceover industry. And my first question was whether it was growing or contracting. It's definitely an industry that is growing. Mm. But not only is it growing, it's growing in many different directions uh, to such a degree that it's almost impossible to put your finger on which aspects of the industry to will be the ones that uh, rise to the top. For example, there are many different people now who are producing demo reels. There are many different people now who are many more people, I should say, who are, who have become coaches and many of them are union talent, you know, very skillfully trained actors who've gotten into voice acting and are damn good at, teaching that craft. Once upon a time, the union used to be able to boast having the best talent, no matter where you go. And it was true, still is true. But now that same talent is teaching the newcomers who are non-union so that you have a pool of non-union actors who are also very well trained in voice acting. That's true. And then you have the, uh, just to finish the point, you have the pay to play sites, which are having an impact on the industry, have had an impact on the industry for some years now. And one of them recently having bought voicebank.net is creating another very dramatic shift. Mm -hmm. So there's all this stuff going on. No one really knows how it's going to play out. So it's a, it's very much a moving target as an industry. And you have to dive in with your eyes wide open, your head on a swivel and paying attention to what's happening and what seems to make sense for you personally and whatever your vision is for where you think it's all going. I'd say another interesting point to be aware of is that it's 
not really one industry. It's several industries, you know? Mm. I mean, the people looking for commercial voiceover are not the same people who are looking for video games, are not the same people who are looking for audiobooks, are not the same, you know? Mm -hmm. All of those industries are independently affected by different things and are also independently growing and shrinking in different ways. So that's a great that's a great point, I think, because a lot of folks, they come into the industry with one idea in mind. Maybe they have a head full of character voices and they just want to get into animation. And that's really the way they see the industry. And when they get in, they realize not when they get in, but when they start talking to people. Yeah. They realize that one, that's probably one of the most difficult ways to hope to break in. Yes. <laughs> and that commercial is more likely. And then it's what is this commercial thing? Oh, that's where they want to hear your regular speaking voice. Yeah. And uh, and then how do you do that becomes part of the training, of course, and and there's a whole lot to learn about how to render your regular voice sure. for a spot. But it and, also depends on location, right? Because like I'm in New York City and here, you know, there is animation, but not nearly on the level that you have in LA. Yeah. And so uh, while, you know, these days with things being digital and everything, in theory, anyone can audition for anything from anywhere. But realistically, you know, for a lot of these sorts of things for like an animation, you know, for something like that, they're going to want to bring you in. And whether the industry is shrinking or or growing and what your chances are does depend on what your location is. For instance, also with audiobooks, that's based in New York. So all the publishers are here. So in some cases, although you can do it from anywhere, it's a different situation here versus, say, I don't know, Chicago or something. How do you feel um, a talent starting today how would they differentiate themselves? And can they climb from the point of complete newbie to a pro level? Is that still a realistic proposition? I think it, it's absolutely a realistic proposition. It's certainly very different from, the, from uh, you know, 15 years ago. So branding is a, a critical piece of it. But the uh, brand that is marketing or finding a way to cut through. But the, uh, if you're just breaking in, and even if you've been in for just a short time, say, you do have to find where you're going to fit. So it's not like you just get to say, oh, I'm going to be an animation person, or I'm going to be an audiobook person because I love audiobooks. You have to start to put your talent out there in such a way where it can be gauged by professionals who, with whom you're working until you're able to kind of figure out where you're going to have the, the best uh, chances for success. Yeah. And then as you pursue those avenues, you're going to eventually realize, hey, I seem to be getting booked more on a particular type of commercial or I'm being called to do narrations, but I never get any commercial work. So between you and your agents and managers and so on, you start to realize what the industry thinks of you. Yeah. And that becomes what your brand is now going to be constructed around. Anything else is going to be on the fringes. And where you'll have to work harder to, you know, develop and cultivate. So how do you know if it's a good time to throw yourself into the industry? We talked about this and some of the associated dangers of potentially jumping in too soon. When jumping to make a demo, you know, I've seen a lot of people who, who they're, you know, they're just so excited. And I get that because it is exciting. It's an, it's an exciting field and it's fun and you want to get out there and, and start working. But, you know, people's memories are long yeah. and it is a fairly, even, even with the explosion that's happened with the internet and everything, it's still kind of a small world in the sense that if you do make a demo well before you're ready and start shopping it around everywhere, later on, you know, when you are ready and you have something new and improved, it, it's going to be a challenge to sort of erase that first impression that you already made before you were really ready. And that's something I've seen happen a lot, you know, when I'm talking with producers, you know, we're in the control room and you're like, oh, that person, you're like, didn't I just hear them like a couple months ago? (laughs) Yeah, I'm not interested, you know, and they might not even listen to the new thing because you've already kind of jumped out there before it was really the appropriate time to do it. And I'm not trying to scare anyone. It's just that I think that there's a balance you know, where 
if you wait until you know 100% that you're ready, of course, that's never going to happen. Mm. Because right. a lot of us, if you're like me and a little bit of se- obsessive, you're always, you know, you're always have one more thing to fix. One more right. thing to fix. But <laughs> on the other hand, if you jump out really soon before you've kind of gotten a lay of the land, you can be actually doing yourself a real disservice. The first question is from Kellen Fasola. I think I've pronounced her name correctly. She says, I'm starting a new career at age 32. What is one thing that I should know starting out in voiceover? That age 32 is extraordinarily young. That's true. She's going to yeah. love that. And she has a lot, a lot, a lot of real estate in front of her. Yeah. For her mentioning that, it seems like she thinks it may be an issue, but it's clearly not. Yeah. I mean, I, I think a lot of people that are coming, if, if they're people who have been career actors already and they're coming from an on-camera point of view, especially women, mm. you know, there's this really prevalent idea of the sort of age expiration. And that's kind of one of the great things about voiceover is that that's not necessarily true. I mean, yeah. I've worked, I worked with this one woman who voiced for eight years a very popular cartoon character, a teenage boy. And she did that for, yeah, she did that for over eight years and she's in her late forties. Nobody cares. Like Nancy Cartwright. What do you sound like? Well, I, for the record, I'm not talking about her. That would be <laughs> great. But, uh, but, you know, I mean, what you sound like is really what matters. And that's not to say people aren't going to judge you a little bit by how you look. Unfortunately, I think that does happen sometimes now, mm. but it's not the same as commercial work where it's like well if you're a woman pack up and die at 30 because yeah Yeah. this is a little bit uh this this connects with what i was referring to earlier when i talked about the emotional side of of voice acting because you see it you know up close and personal when you're working one-on-one with people uh in private and where she's coming from right now is is more emotional right in terms of how she feels about where she is as as it relates to her age perhaps Mm -hmm. uh when the things that she needs to do have to do with things that everyone needs to do, whether they're starting at age 18 or age 80, and that's going to be learn what this business is about. Right. Yeah. Get the training that you need uh, to, to cultivate your abilities to perform in front of the microphone, to interpret scripts, to follow direction, et cetera. And uh, if you're feeling like you're too old or if you're feeling like uh, – there's something against you because of your nationality or gender, et cetera. Or even if you feel embarrassed on some level to, uh, to put yourself out there in front of people, a fear, fear of failure. There's a, you know, there are dozens and dozens of emotional, uh, hindrances that people have to deal with to break through and do something like voice acting, which does require acting does require you to tap into aspects of yourself that you have to bring to bear on the copy in the moment. Right. Whether it's, to, whether it's to smile or be angry or to be frustrated, whatever the, the, the tone is, bringing those things to bear in the moment takes uh, acting training. And life experience that you can bring that to that, that benefits you if you're older. Yes, absolutely. Abs- yeah, I mean, I would, I would say that, yeah, being able to access experiences that could inform your read is incredibly valuable. In episode two of the podcast, I spoke with Jody Crangle and Jim Kennelly about the voice actor. If episode one was about the voice industry, we zoomed in and looked at the voice actor in this episode. And my first question was, are the skills required to be a professional voice actor innate or can they be learned? You can learn most of the things that are necessary to become a successful voiceover talent. Certainly, it's important to have talent. But you can grow your skills as a voiceover talent through lessons, through uh, reading out loud is a good suggestion. I think it's very important to bring a background that's developed, uh, that you've had other experiences in your life. Uh, When we cast and we look for voices, start to get to know voices, uh, voice talents, we're looking to understand who they are, what they've done in their life. Maybe they've uh, worked as lobbyists. Maybe they've worked in the medical profession. Maybe they've been police officers. Uh, We try to understand that about a person because of the authenticity and the real tea that uh, producers want in voiceovers today. Mm. We're trying to match up who someone is inside of themselves with also with their ability to deliver copy. That's interesting because 
I wouldn't initially jump to that as you know life lessons being a critical skill to br- or um, thing to bring to a career in voiceover, but I completely agree that absolutely is. Yeah, I, w- relevant. I would say that uh, yeah, my experience is the best talent are intelligent. It comes mm. across the mic. It comes through. They're able to understand what a writer or producer is aiming at. They're able to quickly understand what's trying to be achieved in the copy. Uh, so it's much more than just a mechanical exercise when you're reading on mic. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. When you're really trying to communicate someone's best ideas one to another, it takes a little more soul. Right. Interesting that neither you nor Jody, and I feel the same way, none of us have mentioned having a big, booming, fantastic voice. It's <laughs> no. it's, it's more about, yeah, it's, it's more, more about, what you do with it. Yeah. But obviously, you, Jamie, and you, Jody, are talents, and I'm not. I'm a producer. I'm a director. I do casting. But right away, I know that both of you have fantastic voices. You have lovely voices that are easy to listen to. Uh, You don't have to be this sort of deep resonant or this, you know, Kate Mulgrew type of female voice. You know, there was a moment for that. Uh, Understandably, my career is a little longer than yours. Uh, So there was a moment of that in the 80s and 90s where that was kind of the vogue. But uh, voiceovers is always changing. Uh, As a, whether it's here in the United States or around the globe, uh, culture is always changing. So the Mm -hmm. type of voices that people are responding to changes with our cultural changes. So what do you think then is one of the hardest challenges for a new voice actor? We're in 2017 right now. What is it that's, what's the biggest challenge to overcome? That's a good question. I mean, my first response to that would be getting out of your own way. (laughs) Right, yeah. Um, Mostly because, you know, I do consider this acting, but it's a different type of acting. Mm. And you sort of have to be yourself at the same time. And you have to be yourself while you have headphones on and you're speaking in front of a long cylindrical object and you're in a booth that's completely, you know... It's a completely manufactured environment, <laughs> yeah. and yet you have to sound natural. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know? conversational. So, yeah, so that does require acting. It, it requires being in your head so that you can be where you need to be um, in order to get across the emotions and connect with the copy, you know, that in order to do that in the way that you need to do it to satisfy the copywriters and the people who are making the commercial or the you know, um, anthem, anthemic video or whatever it is you're doing. So you think overthinking is, is a problem when people start out, they make... Uh, yeah, I think it can really stop a lot of people up. Um, and that that just goes away with, with practice and mm. with coaching and with understanding your environment as you go. Um, because the more uh, comfortable you are in front of a microphone, the less it impacts you when you're actually performing. I think patience is very important Mm -hmm. when you're starting out. Uh, We also, we always talk about how patience equals trust and trust equals speed. Uh, The industry is all about speed now. So when Mm -hmm. a new talent is uh, looking at this industry, this industry is moving at such a fast pace that it's difficult to think you can get on the train. Like it's moving so quickly. It's moving at warp speed. So uh, how do I catch up to warp speed? Uh, But what we say to... uh, young talents or even young producers, uh, I always tell them like, hey, you have to be patient because in being patient with talent, be patient with your clients, you build up trust. Yeah. And once you start to build up trust, that's when you start to pick up speed. Mm -hmm. And now I know that if I was, had a script and I had a client that needed to cast it and I sent it to you, Jamie, or if I sent it to you, Jody, I trust you guys because we know each other as professionals, that you're going to be able to fly through that material and get me this audition back so quickly in Mm -hmm. a really professional, perfect way. So for young talents, I would say you really just need to be patient. You know, just take your time, Mm. learn, you know, take your classes, read out loud as Jody suggested, uh, some of the suggestions Jamie is giving you. And if you're patient, you'll gain the trust of the people you work with, and then all of a sudden you'll find that you've picked up the speed that's necessary to be successful in the industry right now. Jody and Jim have been in the industry for a while now, and I asked them how things have changed in the last 10 years. Well, I think as Jim mentioned before, things have gotten a lot faster. Mm. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, you know, I have been asked by clients to deliver projects to them um, in a half an hour. And, right. you know, being able to do that is part of my value added um you know, service. That's part of what I can offer. Mm. Um, but I didn't get, I did not get asked that a whole lot, you know, even five years ago. Right. Um, I think it's just that technology has gotten so, um, well, fantastic. I mean, just the fact of, you know, where we're doing this interview. <laughs> yes. Right. Just, you know, that says it right there. Um, we're not in the same room. I'll just uh, get that out there if anyone's wondering. <laughs> yeah. We're in three but different locations. it sounds locations. like we are. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's just technology has gotten so incredible in the last five years, even, you know, quicker than that. I mean, I think Zoom is only a, a maybe two years, I think, something like that. You know, these things keep popping up. And so um, clients and producers and studios are aware of all these technologies and they want to use them and I want to use them. And what that does is it speeds up my job. <laughs> right. Um, not only how fast I can do the job, but how fast I can deliver the job. So it's a it's continuing professional development as well. You know, yeah. as you're, yeah. well, very much learning technology. That's that's half of it. Learning the technology. <laughs> yeah. In episode three, things got a bit more serious, and I talked with Eric Shepard and Paul Strickverder about some of the banana skins new talent face coming into the industry, and some of the ways talent can be exploited. Well, you know, often uh, I think they start off being exploited. They're brought into the industry uh, mm. by coaches. You know, coaches, if they don't have a, a steady stream of of starry-eyed newbies coming in, um, you know, they're out of business. Right. So there's a lot of effort uh, online and advertising to tell people, hey, you know, you've got a great voice and anybody can do it and uh, make money from the, the comfort of your own home. So really, you know, before they've, they've even began or, or even done their first audition, they're being exploited. Yeah, yeah, that is a major problem. Paul? Absolutely. So, yes, it's... Um it's not only that, it's also the demo mills. And I think it's also the um, online casting sites because mm. uh, they say, oh my goodness, there's a whole new group of naive people who all think that they can make it big and it is so easy to get started. All you need is a microphone, free recording software and a credit card. So they make it very easy to uh, to get your start. They will take your money. You know, they, they don't care whether you have experience, whether you have talent, as long as you can pay, that is your way to get into the business. It's easy to be self-delusional. You know, you spend a few bucks and you get some of this cool looking gear. And then like Paul says, you sign up with a pay to play. And so now you've got a website and you've got a <laughs> studio and I'm doing air quotes like you could yeah, see me. Yeah, I can um, imagine it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then it's just easy to tell yourself, well, I'm a professional voiceover talent. Uh, you know, when you started two days ago and you know nothing about the business. And uh, unfortunately, the, you know, the reality sinks in pretty quickly. So after discussing some of the potential ways talent can be exploited, I asked Eric and Paul, what are some of the red flags so that you can avoid becoming prey? I, I think the biggest red flag uh, is if you're going to sign up, and this is a fairly common business model, uh, where you sign up and you get coaching for, uh, you know, a couple weeks or something or a few months or X amount of classes, uh, and then you leave with your demo. Right. And now you have your demo and you're ready to shop it and you're ready to go out there and they give you a little coupon for 10% off a, a <laughs> website or whatever uh, and tell you to sign up with a pay-to-play and, uh, you know, you have your calling card now. Anybody that's taken a handful of classes is not ready to make a demo. Uh, yeah. And anybody that's making that demo for them knows that it's not a shoppable demo. Yeah. Now, I'm sure there's somebody out there that's amazing. They're a natural. Uh, and out of nowhere, they're able to make something that's great and shoppable. Uh, but, you know, there's how many millions of demos being made every day. And, uh, again, if you've just taken a couple classes and they're saying, and at the end you leave with a, a demo, uh, that's a massive red flag. Right. right. Yeah. And anything that says quick and easy. <laughs> and has dollar signs in it, right? These three <laughs> yeah. elements in the slogan, major red flag. Yeah. Or uh, th there's a few. Uh, there was one that was so egregious years ago. 
uh, would just talk about the millions and millions of dollars that they've personally made. Uh, oh. And you should sign up for their coaching stuff for one ninety nine or whatever. How many, if you've made this many millions of dollars, you're going to be on the beach. You're not going to be coaching newbies right. and desperately, you know. Uh, oh, and speaking, and the, the, the copy uh, is well, uh, I'm paraphrasing. I mean, this was a, a little bit back, uh, but it says something along the lines of there are just waves of money coming in. You need to stand at the shore with a bucket. Oh, dear. <laughs> wow. Which is, I mean, that's evocative, but it's not as <laughs> It is. Look at the copy again. If it's this, we promise you the world type of copy and they're marketing towards newbies, then that's most probably going to be a problem. If yeah. it's so, and you know, and do your research. You're not just going to sign up with uh, whoever, but if you're doing your research and you know who the pros go to, uh, again, you know, people that have been in this business for decades are still going to a Maurice Tobias thing or they're working mm -hmm. with Nancy Wilson or, you know, whatever people, yeah. uh, reputable coaches that are, uh, you know, established, they don't have any, uh, you know, websites promising the moon and the stars for, for people that are coming in off the street. Um, so with just a little bit of research, um, you know, it's fairly easy to kind of figure out who's for real and, and who isn't. Just ask their rates. That helps too. You know, if there's, I would say if, oh, if you can do like five training sessions and you leave with a demo and it's under a thousand dollars, come on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and but the, the problem is people seem to be so impressionable. They want to believe that they can do this. People um, who prey on you can almost feel and touch and taste your desperation because they've right. seen all those shows on TV, you know, like, like The Voice, where people become an overnight success. And they yeah. say, okay, if somebody can do that, <laughs> I can do that. And it doesn't have to cost anything. And let's be honest, technology has made it a lot easier to get your start. You know, you don't have to spend a fortune to build an entire recording studio anymore. Yeah. You can do business with the entire world just from you know, the comfort of your, your, your closet. Yeah. So the, the, it's easier now to enter this business than at any time in the, in the history. So both Eric and Paul are not fans of pay-to-play websites, um, but a lot of talent use them to get their start. So I asked Eric and Paul, what are some of the alternative ways new talents can start out in this industry? Well, look, the, the pay-to-play model uh, is a huge problem for the industry in general. Mm. Uh, but this is not going to be of a concern to somebody who's, you know, who's just coming in. Yeah. Uh, the problem is... Their their choices or their options are limited. Uh, yeah. You know, they're not going to get an agent right away. That most of them don't know how to cold call or you know contact potential clients. Uh, or as Paul says, they don't even know who the hell they are. They don't even know what they're offering. They don't know yeah. uh, you know marketing and branding and you know they don't even know how to use their damn microphone for God's sakes. Right. So you know you don't even need a mic to sign up for one of these sites, yeah. and you get. That day, an audition, mm. uh, you could be a mute. And <laughs> if you have, uh, you know, $300 or whatever it is, you're getting auditions uh, emailed to you. And that's pretty dang exciting, I would imagine, for someone who's, uh, you know, right off the boat. So, yeah. you know, again, what are their other options? Their other options are to do the dang work. Yeah. Um, but that's not real. You know, everybody wants to do it quick. Like Paul said, you know, everybody wants to be on a reality show uh, and they're instantly famous. So when it's a little difficult to get an audition uh, and again, you know, you could just pay some money and then all of a sudden they show up. And, wow, this is like a thousand dollars. I'm going to read for that along with however many, you know, millions of other starry eyed hopefuls. Yeah. Um, and then sadly, which I think a lot of them don't realize uh, very, very sadly uh, there's some pros on these sites as well. Mm -hmm. And their thinking is, well, I'm really good. I've been doing this for a while and I don't care about the damage it's doing to the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, you know, I'm basically uh, going to kind of poach the jobs from here because I know what I'm doing. Uh, so you're not just competing uh, against, um, you know, other newbies when you're on these sites. There's the occasional pro that's that's sadly still there. Uh, and these people are going to trounce you because they know what they're doing. They know how to read copy. Um, you know, they're actors. So, again, that's, a, you know, another reason. And there's people that aren't going to listen to us. And good, you know, if you really, if you think you're different, and that's what, that's 
what most people do. I think this is what keeps it going. They say, well, I'm different. I'm smarter. I'm more unique. I have a great voice. I sound just like X, Y, or Z, and yeah. uh, they're making millions. Uh, you know, go for it, but brace yourself. So we're painting a rather bleak picture of the industry, but I wanted to know what are the chances actually of achieving success in this industry and what can you do to increase those chances? You know, everybody knows how unbelievably difficult it is to become the next, uh, you know, huge Hollywood star. But, you know, the buses are still unloading every day in L.A. So there's always people that are going to, you know, chase the dream. Uh, And I don't think any... Uh, of the three of us are, are telling, you know, everybody out there, hey, don't do it. Let's not have another brand new voiceover talent ever. Yeah. Um, but like you say, you know, it's depressing. I'd rather people be depressed because they know the truth and then they'll get over it and look for something else uh, than be broke uh, because they've been giving, you know, all their money to people uh, that aren't putting them on the right path. That's that's better. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Yeah, I, I think that that's another thing people just underestimate when they say, oh, okay, I'm going to be a voice actor, a voice talent. And all I do all day long is read scripts and make money. Mm-hmm. And they forget that you, the moment you hang up your shingle and say, I'm a professional voice actor, you are the CEO, you are the CFO, the head of marketing, advertising, sales, you run the bloody bookkeeping department, you're your own audio engineer and the feature talent. And on top of that, you're running a global business. Yeah. So, um, I sometimes think that um, you, you might have the, the most wonderful voice in the world, but if you don't know how to become a pro, how to run a freelance business like a business, you don't really stand the chance. And mm-hmm. the person that maybe has not such glorious pipes, but knows how to run their business like a freelance business will stand a greater chance. Absolutely. The voiceover industry is very much divided into two tiers, the union world and the non-union world. And I asked Eric and Paul if it was harder today to move from the non-union world to the union world. Uh, I think it is more difficult. You know, you mentioned the, the being a big union talent, mm. uh, and those lines are blurred. You know, it used to be years ago, uh, you, you did your time and you were in the trenches and then you, be, you got your card and, uh, you know, that was it. You made it. And now you had, uh, you know, the, the best opportunities and you were paid fairly uh, and you had health insurance, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Uh, but nowadays, uh, you know, some of the the best talent in the world are non-union or FICOR for a myriad of reasons. Yeah. Uh, and every dang union talent in the world is doing non-union work. Uh, and unfortunately, all the so many, many, and this is a, a, an occurrence daily, uh, clients are going non-union because they're taking advantage of these cutthroat voiceover rates because there's so many people in here. Like you said, you know, some folks, they don't want to be professional or, uh, you know, they're, they're hobbyists. So they're playing in our playground and they're, and they're mucking stuff up. So you've got these, uh, you know, super low rates for, uh, you know, almost every project, the rates are, are going down and down and down. Um, scale doesn't change. So now the clients are moving away from the union. So it's more difficult really for anybody. Because even if you're at that lower level, like you said, the rates that are out there now are getting lower and lower by the month, it seems. Uh, Mm -hmm. And even if you said, well, I'm immune to that because I've got my SAG card. Well, now all the the producers are going non-union to take advantage of those rates. So Mm -hmm. uh, really, wherever you fall in that, you know, the the echelon uh, or whatever rung of the ladder you're on, uh, things are getting tougher all over. I mean, are the Coca-Colas of this world, are they, are they worried about the amount of money they're paying to talent? Oh, my God. The, the Disneys and the Googles of the world are putting out, you know, full buys for uh, at less than a tenth of what it would have been uh, union. And they've got more money than God. Yeah. I mean, they're laughing all the way to the bank because for them, for the clients, you know, I don't hear them complaining because you get more for less. <laughs> yeah. But I... I Somebody wanted to know, um, you know, how do I become really a top-notch, very well-known voice actor? And I think the the way to approach that is to not become a voice actor, but become a very famous on-camera actor, because you know, that's how we get to know them. And that's how these people get all these nice jobs on the side as voice actors. That's, See, so that's yeah. the shortcut to make mm-hmm. it in voiceover, <laughs> just be a Hollywood star. Right. And then you really, you can get in a voiceover pretty quickly. It's as easy as that. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That's, that's the takeaway. The, that's how you 
say you do an end run around this system. So in episode four, I was in my element, really. We were talking technology when it comes to voiceover and recording. And joining me were two excellent audio people, Amanda Rose Smith and Tim Tippetts. And my first question was, for those starting out in the industry, what is your first technical consideration? Your space. Mm. Yeah, I have to agree with that. You have to have a a quiet space to voice in, and uh, you can find them in the most surprising places. Uh, A quiet closet in your home is a great way Mm. to start out. Totally, and clothes absorb sound, so... You know, yeah, exactly. Win-win. Yeah, and you can even throw some, uh, you know, some treatment, uh, like a moving blanket on the door of the closet. Definitely. And uh, if you got some carpet in there, you mm-hmm. know, you're good to go. In fact, I can tell you for a fact that we've heard a lot of promos uh, and, and other pieces, commercial pieces, on television that have come from a closet. Absolutely. I know people who've done hundreds of audiobooks in their closet. And, you know, for those, you got to sit there for quite a while. But... You know, it doesn't necessarily take a super pro looking space, you know, to make a pretty pro sounding product. Secondary to that is equipment. And I think Mm -hmm. it's important uh, to throw this out here early to anyone um, who is starting their voiceover career to understand that it's really easy to get overly involved in the type of equipment that you need the software that you need, because there's so much information out there, especially on, you know, uh, destinations like YouTube mm. and forums where everyone is an expert. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and that's fine. You know, I'm not saying that some of them aren't experts. There are plenty of them out there. I'll say that. But yeah, but it, <laughs> it, I mean, it only takes tripping over one thread to get the wrong idea. And then someone says, hey, you know, get a Neumann U87. Uh, <laughs> and then you go out and spend three or four thousand dollars and. Uh, the equipment that you have doesn't support that mic. Yeah, uh, and we see this all the time on when they do mic shootouts between you know and it's all the clickbait, right? A mm-hmm. uh, hundred dollar mic against a Neumann U eighty seven, and then the conclusion is it sounds just as good, but you're also uploading to YouTube, so we're not getting all of the yeah. sonic information. And, number one, and the space also makes a big difference, you know, because especially yeah. if you're recording in a space that isn't ideal. I tell people, I'm like, yeah, you could get a U eighty seven, but it's kind of like if you go to a supermarket and stand under a fluorescent light and wear no makeup and then take a nice close up picture with a great HD camera, yeah, are you going to be happy true. with that? Probably yeah. not. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. Really well put. And that, and that, you know, so these trappings that, that new people get into, there's just so much information out there. The, the secret is there is no secret. Right. Just keep it simple. Mm-hmm. You don't need to spend thousands of dollars to get into this game, no. nor should you. I mean, as you as you continue to succeed and you're building your voiceover career, should you improve your entire audio chain? Absolutely. But when you're starting out, you're not going to be voicing for Lexus. No. You're not going to be voicing mm-hmm. for, you know, and, and so uh, spend appropriately. You know, a few hundred dollars will get you started. Get yourself sure. in a closet. And besides, anyone who's getting into the game... Uh, unless you're already a pro, you've got some room to improve, and that takes coaching uh, oh, from voiceover coaches before you're even ready to hit the ground running anyway. Yeah. Um, although I would say there are some minimum things which I think will get people off the ground mm-hmm. um, more quickly. What, you know, If you've ever seen me write on the internet, one of the things you'll see me see a lot is that, uh, see me say a lot, is that I don't like USB mics. Mm, I don't think the quality ceiling um, is worth the low cost. Mm. Um, So even though they often seem cheaper initially, I would usually tell people it's a better idea to get an inexpensive mic and pair it with an inexpensive interface. Mm. Um, I think that the sound, your ability to make a better sounding uh, product is better. And also... It allows you to upgrade in a modular way. So, for instance, you can upgrade your mic a little bit later and then maybe get a new interface a little bit later as opposed to having to have this all-in-one product that's not giving you what you want. Having the equipment is one thing, but being able to use it is quite another. So we then talked about how best to use mic technique for the optimum sound quality. 
I have my uh, Neumann off to the side about five inches from me and I'm cross talking it, mm. right? So the diaphragm, if it were an eyeball, is looking right at my mouth. I've got it vertically positioned so it's right mm. where my mouth is. Don't say eyeball. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, as if it were an eyeball uh, <laughs> looking at my mouth um, so that I don't have to deal with, uh, you know, a pop screen or, or anything like that. Because, uh, yeah, speaking directly into your mic, even sometimes when you have a pop screen, you can still pop the mic just like that. Yep. Um, but uh, I think it's really important to also point out that along with the space that you're voicing in, along with the equipment, I cannot stress enough how important proper mic position is oh yeah yeah it's super super important and unfortunately uh when i'm approached by students i get this a lot well when i you know when i look on the videos and they're in the studio the the mic's way up here and i'm like yeah but it's also a 12 by you know 15 room Mm. that's been treated and the room's not going to respond so for instance if i back off my mic like this even if i raise my voice you're going to start hearing my room yeah. yeah. Right. So the closer you are to the mic, the the more you can lower your gain. So the better your uh, noise to signal ratio. Plus, you get proximity effect with a lot of mics. Plus, so. you get proximity. Now, for me, I get hired a lot for that in your ear read, but yeah. I can also back that off in EQ uh, after the fact. But right? I'd I also like to point it. out here that this is genre dependent as well. Because, for is. instance, mm-hmm. although I work to some degree in all the genres, I work. Anybody who knows me knows I work a lot in audiobooks, and the standard isn't to be real up on the mic. So what I usually tell people, one of the biggest mic placement issues I see is people being too close, actually. Right. Yes. And in terms of popping, in terms of breathing, because, you know, in audiobooks, you don't remove the breaths. Because, frankly, you would go insane if you're going to do that for, like, 10 hours of material. I have um, no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> um, no, I, I agree with you 100%, and I don't do audiobooks. I don't do, yeah. I don't do uh, long-form stuff. I'm in, and I'm out. That, get, that eating of the mic is a problem with radio people. They're so used to getting yeah. their lips right on the grill to get yeah, that. Yeah, but, like, for instance, for books, it's what's best is to have that pop screen two to three inches from your mic. Mm. And then for you to be six to eight inches away from that. Yeah. So, and in in that position, you're getting rid of the vast majority of the pops. You're getting rid of the loud <gasps> kind of gasping breaths, although you yep. shouldn't be doing that anyway, but you know. Yeah. Um, now, now again, though, this, this is assuming that you have a, a well-treated space. space. Exactly. That's because, again, if you back off that mic, um, you know, I'm not going to say that getting closer to the mic is a Band-Aid, but Amanda's absolutely right. Uh, you know, it's it's a give and take type of thing. Well, so and like for promo, it. for instance, which which I know you do, um, mm-hmm. you got to be right up on it. Yeah, you do. You need to be in their head. So it, it, sure. it depends really a lot on the genre. And, you know, if you're doing animation, you have to be able to yell. So yep. there's a lot of different things to think about depending on like there's not a lot of silver bullet information for that kind of stuff for like yeah. overall you know, there's not like one thing that you can do for every instance. It's dependent a lot of, on what you're trying to accomplish. So I'm going to get a bit indulgent on this one because we were talking about acoustics and the environment in which you record. So allow me to take you through my current studio setup. I'm going to blow everyone's mind here and tell you that I'm in a closet right now. <laughs> Um, Whoa. Oh, I know. I'm not surprised. Yeah, um, you can hear it. <laughs> no, uh, no, I can't hear. It. I can't hear it. No, but I'm just not surprised yeah. because mm-hmm. you can make it sound good. I'm yeah. I'm in a temporary home right now. We're choosing our next location, so I've set up in a closet, and it's I don't know. Well, it's probably about six foot square. It's not. It's not totally square, which is good. In New York City, I'm like, that sounds luxurious. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's my living room. That's like a whole apartment. <laughs> um, but. This studio has not got a ton of fancy acoustic treatment. It's got some um, Aurelex style foam, which is a brand of foam manufacturer specifically for audio. It's also got a few chunks of just random upholstery foam and things like that. Different thicknesses, different different uh, shapes, and a ton of junk. And frankly, <laughs> junk is some of the best acoustic treatment stuff if you're in a small space. Because it, what it does is it diffuses as well as absorbs the sound. Yeah. And diffusion is much more even in how it treats the sound as opposed to absorption, which absorbs across the frequency spectrum differently depending on the foam you're using. So what you're aiming for 
in a, any kind of recording space with the voice particularly is quite an even amount of absorption across the frequency spectrum so your voice sounds like it does just without any of the uh reverberation in the space that you're in and if right. you absorb and diffuse equally across the, fre- the spectrum everything is getting absorbed and diffused at the same rate so i find that experimentation is the key if you don't have a big budget if you can get in your space and set up your mic do a bit of recording bring in some stuff put it in the corners because that's where a lot of bass book gets built up mm-hmm. and then experiment bring in some foam bring in some acoustic foam bring in just random bits and pieces like uh tim said bring in uh, packing yeah. blankets things like that and a real mixture of stuff i find creates the best possible sound and it when you're first starting out what it looks like you know it doesn't matter it doesn't matter yeah. what it looks like so no, it really doesn't matter so yeah go from that point and you know as so long as you've got junk in your house which everyone does <laughs> um, <laughs> you'll be fine <laughs> just just don't use like big open storage bins without a lid right yeah. <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah things it, with mass to make yeah. it sound tubby, but it's funny because as as uh, an engineer when you're monitoring you know you might be mis- uh, mixing a track or something uh, we think of diffusion as our friend in that regard. Mm. But you're bringing up a really great point, which is diffusion in the booth. And I love that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's something you can do for cheap because any uh, item that has mass and has a funny shape is going to scatter the, the sound waves, which is what exactly. diffusion does. Like you just yeah. look at it like in the same way that you think about reflecting light. You know, yeah. if you have a bunch of surfaces that are pointing in different directions so that those waves are going to be like ping, ping in all different directions and not be bouncing back and forth of the same surfaces like a ping pong ball. Um, that's what you're trying to avoid and it's really easy to do because most things are not the same shape as other things so you've got your audio into your computer via your microphone and your interface what do you do then we discussed post-processing if you don't understand eq if you don't understand compression if you don't understand gating and really gating is kind of a four-letter word in the in the (laughs) in the world of vo especially for engineers because what we really should be using is is a form called downward expansion. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Let's um, hang on. Which, hang on, Tim. Let's back up yeah. here. Um, we're talking about the processing of audio once it's got into your computer. Right. Correct. Right. Correct. So this is this is all post processing after you've recorded and what you're going to do yeah. to to treat that. So thanks, Jamie. The fact um, that it should be post is probably what you're getting to tim though I think. yes yeah. it, re- it really should especially if you're starting out so like right now i'm on the apollo twin i've got this uh pre that i've got loaded a preamp and i've got some eq and some and some light compression on it and i prefer it that way because i want to print that and if i'm having a live session i want it to sound the best that it can to them so that they don't have to work on my audio too much mm-hmm. but yeah. when you're starting out it's really really important that you are well informed and well informed does not mean go and find one source and then roll with it because someone can tell you to normalize your audio uh, to minus three because it's the industry standard Mm. and you don't know the difference between peak normalization and RMS normalization and normal RMS for people who are listening root mean squared. That's what that stands for. Mm -hmm. You could probably very quickly, quickly get the idea that that means averaging of some sort. And when you do that, you're going for a baseline average level. Right. And so you can end up with a VO that's just consistently the same level and it sounds overly compressed. And so anyway, it's really easy to train wreck yourself yeah. if you go in thinking you know, but then you don't. And unfortunately, you only have to do that one or two times to an engineer before he just deletes your audition. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Because he knows, he knows what to expect. Well, and also... I think it's also worth pointing out because you said that, that there is, just so you guys know, there's no advantage, there's no difference between applying these effects after the fact or before. Yeah. You know, I mean, people will say, well, won't it sound better if I have it EQ'd going in? Not if you, if you do that same EQing to your audio afterwards, it's the same result. Just so long as you give yourself plenty of headroom before you hit your converter. Sure, sure, yeah. I mean... But what I'm saying is that you're not missing out on anything by applying this after the fact. Absolutely. And you're also, you're protecting yourself because when you have the raw audio and you're applying effects afterwards, you can undo it. So talking about post-processing, I wanted to know, is it a requirement of a voice talent to be able to process and work with their audio 
or is that the audio engineer's job? It mm. depends. <laughs> that's the that's the, uh, the response that Jim was was. But is that uh, your job as a voice actor to to work with that? Um, I can address that uh, if you don't mind, Amanda, sure, because sure. Um, of the teaching aspect of what I do. So here's I get asked this question all the time, mm. and. When I am dealing with a new client for a, a project, uh, once in a while they'll say, hey, don't do anything to your audio at all, um, which, you know, I always do. And I've never heard back from anybody who said, hey, don't do any, you know, I told you not to do anything to your audio, right? <laughs> <I'm> because, <the> <laughs> same. <laughs> because what they're getting from me once I deliver it is they're getting something that has a kiss of, you know, nice compression, yeah. e- EQ'd into a, into a better state. Than it was before. So the conversation for me is this. If you're in a booth, you are in a box, all right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, right around 500 hertz, we know where this is, right? Honk, uh, which mm-hmm. is usually mm-hmm. referred to in the music industry. If you are improving the signal before you're sending it to them, okay, you're just removing, because that's job number one, take away the stuff that we don't like. So rolling off on the low end to get rid of a lot of the noise, sure. mm-hmm. maybe cut some of the boxiness. If you did just that, You could greatly improve your audio. But the thing is, is that people want, they have it in their mind that if they send it in and it sounds like a promo trailer, then somehow that's going to impress the other person. Mm -mm. And they're just going to be like, wow, this is the greatest thing that I've ever heard. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that's that's not what's happening out there, guys. The real pros and and, uh, J. Michael Collins says the same exact thing that I do because I cast from time to time. The first 80% of what you get goes in the trash can. Because it has audio problems or it's a misread, they're not right for the part, whatever. Then you have this 80 to 90% that usually consists of people who are killing the read, but the audio is bad or vice versa. And then you have this top 10% that people sometimes like to complain about, which is where the audio is killer, the read is killer. And so, of course, they're getting the majority of the work. Yeah. Right. Sure. So, but the answer is, is that if you know enough, just enough to be dangerous, you probably shouldn't do anything at all to your audio. Yeah. Okay. But if you're trained or you have someone who who really knows what they're doing and they've got you teed up properly, uh, then yes. This is this is a girly metaphor, but it's kind of like the natural look. You know, <laughs> yeah. a lot of a lot of women might be familiar with that where you're wearing a little bit of makeup to look like you're not wearing makeup. Right. And it's the same kind of thing where. If you can do something subtle, like, yeah, like do a little roll off of the way bass frequencies and maybe just a teeny tiny bit of compression, it should still really what you're doing there in a way is making it sound like you just have a slightly better space than maybe you really do. And it's kind of a matter of, well, can they tell that Mm. I did something to it? You know, and that's a really hard that's a really hard distinction to make, especially if you're new. Yeah. But like Tim said, it, you know, there are people, you know, both of us included, I believe, who will make stacks, for mm. instance, who might be able to make you a sort of basic light setting that mm. will just do a little bit that will kind of give it a little bit of an edge to make it just sound a little bit better. And the reason and the way you're able to do that and someone starting out isn't is because you've edited thousands of hours of audio. Oh, sure. So you know you know what is going to work and what isn't. Exactly. And you yeah. and you are after all voicing in a box. Mm. So if I didn't have this cut that I have right now, I'm running uh, some EQ in real time, but if I boost this up to let people hear what boxiness sounds like, <laughs> okay? Mm. This is what boxiness sounds like. And you wouldn't want this in, in your signal. So if you go yeah. in and you remove this, then it obviously sounds much better. Hey, Tim, what, what, what if a voice talent wanted to sound like Darth Vader? <laughs> uh, they'd probably have to have a Darth Vader preset of some sort. I wonder I what that imagine. would sound like. I don't know anybody who oh. has that. Hmm. Let me see if I can find something here. <laughs> I find your lack of faith disturbing. <laughs> What is a general? You are part of the VO Alliance. <laughs> All right, That's my... so good. Do you use that when you're teaching? I feel like you could really get a student's attention. Sometimes I do, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Just to loosen them up. And, you know, because a lot of them are nervous. And 
Um, <laughs> let me switch back here. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Darth you. off camera, you know? Yeah, Darth off camera, exactly. <laughs> so how do you know when your recordings sound right? I asked Amanda and Tim how they go about assessing their audio and how they would recommend others do the same. There's a really strong community Mm. um, in this industry. And I think that anybody, uh, I mean, this is probably counterproductive because we're on a podcast. So it's I'm not like I can tell you people to join the internet because you're on it. But, <laughs> um, but, you know, there are a lot of Facebook forums and forums and other places where a lot of accomplished professionals talk about this stuff. And I think that, you know, when you connect with your industry, you can definitely get a feeling for who's kind of who's doing well, who kind of knows what they're talking about. Yeah. Like I always recommend that people lurk for a while and kind of get a sense of that. And then, you know, listen to their stuff. Like Jamie said, it's, it's a really good idea to do, to do that. And also you, you can um, ask fellow VOs to maybe take a quick listen. Be respectful of people's time. I mean, yeah. you know, the, 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 the phrase pick your brain has got to be like <laughs> the yeah. most, you know, um, but also, and then also hire people, you know, that specialize in this kind of thing. And I would also encourage people to get multiple perspectives. I mean, and going back to that point, Tim, that you made about like the YouTube stuff and running with like one set of advice. Yeah. I think if you want to avoid falling into that trap, because it's the kind of thing that anyone starting out in anything can fall into because you just don't know, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look at multiple sources you can form an aggregate, you know, and when you yeah. find like five people saying the same thing, then it kind of gets to a point where you're like, okay, this sort of seems to be the industry standard. Yeah. This seems to be an explanation that I've heard several different ways. And then you can get confident with that and go. And I know a lot of people, it's an exciting field. You want to like go out and get started right away, but doing your research and sort of approaching it in that methodical way is a really, really important thing to do because, yeah, like I said, it's a supportive community, but it's also a small community. And, you know, like Tim was saying earlier about, you know, you only need to see someone's name a few times and have, you know, before you start deleting their audition, <laughs> pe you only have one chance to make a first impression. Yeah. So it's a really good idea to take advantage of the resources that are out there and kind of take a beat and make sure that you're doing what you want to be doing and then go out and start submitting stuff because it's, I know we get impatient and it's hard to wait, but the rewards that you will reap for doing that are significant. And now my final question of this episode is by far and away the most boring and it's to do with file formats and delivery specs and file transfer when you've completed the job. So there's no way of sexing that up. It's very boring, so take it away, Tim. If you're not sure, then ask what the specs are. And typically, what these guys are looking for, some are in the know, some aren't. So they might be asking for 48K. Mm -hmm. uh, some will ask for 44.1, 16-bit. So for everyone listening out there, 44.1, 16-bit is CD quality. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. So if you're recording in that format, you're more than likely safe at home. But sometimes you will get people asking you for 48, mm. all right, yeah. for, for whatever reason. It doesn't really matter. It's common matter. in video. So yes, usually it if it's something yeah. that's going to be put to video, for whatever reason, mm -hmm. audio that's going with video is almost always 48. But We should also mention that what you're recording at versus what you deliver. So what right. you want to make sure is that you're recording at a high enough quality that you can always go down mm. um, when you deliver the files. That is to say, you don't have to go up into the 96K ridiculous levels. That's that's not going to yeah. help you at all, and it's going to create huge file sizes that are just going to I think it's going to be rare that you'll ever want more than 48. I mean, even, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah. So if you record a decent enough uh, setting, like uh, 48K sample rate, 24-bit bit rate, um, you can then convert down to pretty much anything you need to send out. And so you'll also get the benefit then of all the plugins working at that rate, which they operate slightly better at that and the higher um, sample rates. And yeah, rates. they absolutely yeah. do. They well, it's absolutely like what do. Tim said earlier about having a raw version of something. It's always easier to convert, well, yeah, to convert down because you yeah. can't really convert up. I mean, no. yeah. not, in a, not in a way that sounds good. 
But you can, but it doesn't give you anything. You can, well, you're can you just sending them the file at that rate because they I want mean, it. But, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's look, it's possible. If you record something and it sounds amazing at 44.1 and then they say they want 48, I'm not going to lie. It's not really yeah. a huge deal yeah. <laughs> to then convert it to 48. I mean... I, I think that's more of a checklist item for the engineers because they've been told by management. Yeah. You know, hey, make sure it's all 48. They're checking it. It comes in at 44.1. Yeah. You know, I would I would challenge plenty of people to tell me the difference between forty eight and forty four. Oh, they can't tell. They can't you know, hear it. Yeah, but but all but also if that's not enough about file formats, you had also mentioned something about um, I think FTP uploading and whatnot. Oh, so yeah. yeah. So box to, for people who don't know, that's file file transfer protocol, mm. and it's essentially just a way of getting your files uploaded into the cloud, which is how most of us refer to it these days. And so it, you have servers based in, you know, wherever around the world, you upload your file and then uh, you it sh- have a share link. So you click share next to it. Uh, to, the usual suspects are dropbox.com, mm-hmm. uh, box.com itself. Yeah. Uh, box.com and Dropbox both have apps uh, for iPad, iPhone, Android, I believe. Um, on a side note, uh, box.com rewarded me for loading it on all three of my devices and took my storage from five gigabytes to 50 gigabytes for free. Wow. Uh, Google drive is another option. Mm -hmm. If you look at free FTP, uh, look for the popular ones. Okay. Look for trusted sites. Mm. Don't put yourself in a position where you're looking up free anything and then not knowing what you're clicking on because we all know what happens when someone offers something free mm. yes. uh, or can happen, right? So just make sure it's a reliable source. But uh, guys out there listening, uh, here's how it works. You upload it. Once it's uploaded, there, there'll usually be some sort of a share button. Yeah. You'll share. It will allow you to copy the link and then you just paste it into your email and you say, here you go. Yeah. And when they click on it, they're able to go straight to the file and then have the option to preview it typically or listen to or, or download it. I'll also say, and this is this is just something that I've sort of noticed and come to find, it's worth having some version of a paid account to one of these just because, mm. you know, I've been in a lot of situations where people have been like, oh, my free Dropbox is full. Like I have to do, you know, it's just, it's a little... Personally, I feel like it's a little unprofessional. Like mm. when you're ever in a position where you can't get people the files that they need because of space on your end, it just doesn't really look good. Right. So yeah. I'm not saying spend a definitely don't spend a ton of money. Um, but it's nice if you have a system that's relatively seamless where you can just say no problem. And where also you can leave files up because mm. I also can't tell you how many times you know, that's the danger of stuff like we transfer, for instance, that there's a time limit, right? You send something mm-hmm. to someone and they have a certain number of days. And of course, it seems ridiculous that they wouldn't just download it when you send it. But people sometimes don't. Yeah. And then yeah. it's it's nice to have a link or something that you send to someone that's available for a while. That's funny because yeah. I, I absolutely agree. I, I use uh, Mediafire and uh, it's it's a bit like we transfer stuff like that, mm-hmm. but it's I got the paid account. And I'll sometimes be scrolling through and I'll see a file from like 2012 that's been downloaded like 25 times. <laughs> like, <laughs> wow. Wow. I'm glad I kept that up there because that would have been an email and then I'd have to dig through my system yeah. to find the file, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, that's so a good point. it makes perfect sense to have something that can be up there all the time. Um, yeah. It can save you a huge amount of time. So does anyone actually listen all the way through to the end of this podcast? I don't know. I don't know if I'm just speaking into the void here. Send me a message. Let me know if you do. (laughs) Just send me the word uh, like watermelon (laughs) and I'll know what you mean. Okay. Anyway, that was this week's episode, the highlights package. And I really enjoyed going through everything. Um, There was just so much there. I was going to try and make one episode for all 12 episodes shows that we've done so far as a highlight and i was just going through and i was like no i've got to include that got to include that and um realized it was going to be three so uh we have a trilogy of vo school highlights episodes coming up uh, the remaining two over the next 
maybe not two consecutive weeks because I think there's a Christmas week in there somewhere and I'll be taking a week off there. But the next two will be the remaining two highlights and then we'll be back in the new year with new guests and I have some really exciting and quite unexpected ones coming up. Thank you to everyone who answered the poll that I put on Facebook. Um, That was really helpful for me to find out what kind of stuff you're really interested in. So uh, you should see that being reflected in the content in future episodes. Okay, that's all for me. Sorry you had to hear so much of me this week and for the next couple of weeks. I'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you to this week's guests. Thanks also to our sponsor, J. Michael Collins, social media support from Chris Sharps and Backstage Magazine. Join us next week for another class. <laughs>